Welcome to another episode of Buy or Bust, the game show where we find three hidden gems here at the auction, tell you whether we will buy or bust them, and then make our predictions as to what they will go for across the auction block. And today, Nathan, what are we looking at? Uh, call me Tommy today, and today we're going to be looking at three sleeper vehicles, or vehicles that you may not expect to be really fast. Yeah, and what did we start with here? This is our first car. That's so right. What do we have? This is a 2007 Chrysler 300 SRT. And we may not have all the facts of this vehicle, but we're gonna have a lot of fun with it nonetheless. And this one's definitely seen a lot of fun times, judging by how rough it is. Yeah, I think these are actually really cool cars. And this is, I think, back when they called them the SRT8. Didn't they later change it to the SRT? So it's yeah. a little bit confusing there if you think of the two different generations of the Chrysler 300 SRTs. But this is the first generation of the modern 300s, and this was the first generation to get the SRT badging. That is correct. So this has a 6.1 liter massive Hemi V8. It's putting out about 425 horsepower. And these cars were known for being based on other platforms. Am I correct on that? Yeah, I mean, this was based on the Mercedes E-Class platform, but it was oddly enough kind of the outgoing Mercedes E-Class. Yeah, it's, it's, it definitely goes back quite a bit. Hey, the, at least the engine base clean, if nothing yeah, else this engine, This Hemi looks fantastic. Now, how much power did this put down? 425 horsepower, give or take. Um, granted, we are at high elevation, so it's going to lose a couple of those ponies, not to mention the fact that this has a gazillion miles on it, but... This vehicle was hooked up to five-speed automatic transmission. There was no other option for transmissions and it's rear drive. One of the cool things about these vehicles that a lot of people don't know is that even though it is a pretty big and heavy car, it did have an independent rear suspension and you could make them handle fairly well for something so large and heavy. Absolutely, and the thing that I love about these as well is other than a few little styling tweaks, maybe some bigger wheels, these are aftermarket ones, but even the factory the ones did have bigger wheels and some dual exhaust out back, it was otherwise a fairly under the radar looking kind of vehicle where it wasn't very showy, it didn't shout at you as to what it was, so this was a true definition of a sleeper. Yeah, these things were known to really eat up the quarter mile. A lot of guys like to modify them. Very popular for supercharged modifications, turbocharged modifications, basically forced induction. And they are still, still sought after. So this is going to be a little bit of a prize on the auction block, I believe. All right, you ready to get inside the love machine? Yeah, All I right. think these are actually really cool. So if you look at these seats, they're actually like a suede or is it Alcantara insert with leather outsides. And it is actually fairly well bolstered. I think, I don't think that the factory ones came with this much bolstering, Nathan, did they? No, no, no. The, the, the seats are unique to the car. And if you look right here, you're going to see the SRT logo with the eight right there. Um, this was definitely a unique, somewhat performance seat, but it's still really comfortable. And actually, I'm surprised that the front seats are in decent condition, considering what the car is. Uh, they were also known for having the upgraded stereo system. Uh, this one's got the navigation system as well. Uh, but the coolest thing is the fact that this car doesn't sound like any other Chrysler that you can think of. Absolutely, yeah. And this one, let me turn the music down there. This one is a 2007 with about 129,000 miles on it. And I would say that the interior, I think, is actually held up pretty well. I mean, this is an archaic looking type of screen, but at least you still do have an actual usable screen with some big chunky knobs down here with some automatic climate control where you can set the temperature exactly where you want it, tell it exactly where you want it to blow out, and you can have some nice toasty buns as well as, of course, an ashtray in the middle. But then moving down, you do have some center, center, mount, center console mounted cup holders as well as a nice big storage bin in the center. But pretty basic, you know, Chrysler 300 or Dodge Charger, or you name it, they all kind of looked very similar, but this one just has a few little extra tasty bits. It sure sounds good. I don't think that's a stock exhaust. All right, so taking out the Chrysler 300 SRT8, I have to say, Nathan, of all of the Dodge Chrysler versions of this car, you know, the Challenger, the Charger, this one with the SRT8 package is my favorite of all time. 
it is a really cool car uh, I've been lucky enough to go to the original event for this and then the updated event for it so I, I've driven most of the versions of this and the sad part is this car is going to go away there will be no longer any more Chrysler 300s built uh, at least with a gas engine uh, in the very near future, it's coming to a close. Well, Same it's time. sad to those of us that want one, yeah. but to those that already have one, they're probably celebrating the fact because that means that theirs is going to be that much more coveted. That's right? the question. Is, will this be a collectible? By the way, it doesn't have any power steering. Oh, well, that must make it fun to drive around this tight parking lot we've yeah, got here. It's a lot of fun, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we're moving, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, you know, Should I make steering, a left or sorry, right a, here? Yep, make a right here. Okay. And then just follow this straight all the way to that back fence, and that'll get us to our test track. You got it. So, yeah, Nathan's going to muscle us down to the test track where we can get this up to... I mean, it's been raining out here, so we don't want to go too crazy. Yeah, I'm not going to go crazy. Yeah, but I do want to kind of see the kind of power that this thing has because firing it up, it actually sounds fantastic. It sounds really good. If nothing else, I mean, the car itself is a little rough, but... At least the engine fires right up and sounds good. There are a couple interesting lights that have popped up. Yeah, um, what do we have going on uh, over there? Engine light, gas light, TPMS. Nothing too scary. I mean, that engine light could be anything, really. Yeah, I mean, pretty much every car here at the auction has the gas light on because dealers drop them off with next to no gas in them. And they all have the TPMS light on them because the they batteries sit. go in the tire pressure monitoring systems and people just don't bother... Or they sit for it. a long period of time and lose a little bit of pressure. Exactly. Too, but right? the check engine light could hinder what this actually does go across the auction block for. Especially this power steering um, not working at all is going to hinder what it goes across <laughs> the auction block for yeah. sure. <laughs> I would agree. But we're pulling out here onto the little test track. And do we have brakes, Nathan? That's the important question. I'm going to find out in a second here. I just got to... All right, here we go. Let's just see if they work here. There we go. Okay, we have brakes. So typically, I would say get this up to about 30 to 40 miles an hour on the little test track here. That's about what you can do with this car in this short amount of distance and then slam it on the brakes. Oh, we got a little bit of wheel spin there. Yeah, that's just without Nice. Trying. There we go. Not too oh, bad. Yeah, it, it fires right up. Yeah. Nice. Everything's pretty quick. To work. Yep. Nice. Ooh, I like the sound of that. <laughs> yeah, it's it. I'll break traction all day long. It's it's not, and these tires are not that knackered. So the reality is, in rain or sunshine, with this powertrain, you are definitely going to leave some Elevens on the ground. Absolutely. Well, Nathan, let's park it up and see whether we will buy or bust it. Okay. Well, Nathan, here's the important question: Would you buy or bust the Chrysler 300 SRT8? Well, Tommy and I agree. This is a hidden gem. And in addition, it's one that a lot of people don't realize has beefed up brakes, beefed up suspension, more comfortable seats, better stereo system. Everything's been upgraded, not to mention the engine and transmission. So absolutely buy it. Okay, and I am going to give you an agreement here. I think that this is a buy all day long, but what do you think it's going to go for across the auction block? Oh, that's a really good question. So I think this is going to go for, considering its exterior condition and some of the other things that people are going to look at first. Well, and before you give me your guess, I have to tell you, this is a wholesale auction. So ah. keep in mind, these are dealers bidding against each other for the opportunity to have this on their lot and then to sell it at a profit. So keep that in mind with your guess. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say this is going to go for eleven. Eleven thousand dollars Yes. I think with the issues that we have on here with the check engine light and the power steering, yeah. it's going to go for a little bit less. My guess is that it's going to be closer to that $10,000 mark. Ooh, but we're pretty close, aren't we? Yeah, we're not too far apart. So I think your guess was pretty decent, but let's toss the auction and see how it does. All right, Nathan. So the results are in the Chrysler 300 being the first car that we guessed on. Your guess was $11,000. My guess was $10,000. We were both pretty close on our numbers. And um, I have to say, we were both also pretty darn ambitious because although it opened at an asking price of $8,000, it didn't get a bid it until it hit $5,000 <laughs> and eventually sold for $5,250. So we were both really high on our numbers. Wow. But I was slightly less high than you. So yeah. I guess I'll take the first win. You get that win. 
All right, Nathan, Tommy, for our next pick, what do you have here? We have an interesting vehicle because it's not what it seems. This is a 2007 Chevrolet Cobalt SS. Well, the Cobalt SS is a really cool vehicle, and I know they came in a few different variations, right, with the supercharged four-cylinder, pumping out like 200 horsepower to the front wheels via a five-speed manual. Is that what this is? No, yes, no, it's not, it's really not. So what, what? this is, this is essentially a styling package with the mid-level four-cylinder engine. It's not the supercharged one. So what you're getting here is a vehicle that does have similar suspension setup it's got the cool wheels and tires it even has a larger exhaust system and instead of it having the anemic base four-cylinder engine this is the mid-level four-cylinder engine well so that base engine was a 2.2 liter four-cylinder pumping out about 148 horsepower but this what do you want to call it like a mid-level cobalt precisely would get the 2.4 liter four cylinder that bump power up to what about 170 180 horsepower right which i mean it, it's fine like that's kind of quick for sure but it's no ss in my mind yeah and see that's the problem uh and we didn't know this coming in here that this wasn't the supercharged one so this is tommy's fault um and and more importantly this vehicle still has the ability to handle fairly well. It is faster than a regular Cobalt, so you can look at that as a positive. And in theory, I suppose you could put a supercharger or a turbocharger on here, because you got all the other stuff to make it look cool. Uh, we should probably have a look at the interior though. Yeah, let's check it out. Uh, all, right. all right. So hopping on the inside, I have to ask Nathan, oh God, <laughs> yeah. why is everything sticky? If you open up the uh, center armrest. I would rather not. Uh, but, but look in, the, oh yeah, I was hoping you, oh, gosh. oh he almost, oh he didn't. Yeah, I know you want me to touch the top, <laughs> I already did that because it's all sticky, yeah, exactly. gross. Yeah, oh. this, this car has some unusual adhesive qualities to it. Um, so if you look at the center stack, you're going to notice that it's not exactly uh, in great shape, but more importantly, it also doesn't house the top of the line stereo system, which I believe you could get in the SS supercharged. Now, well, by I the have way, to the say, S I mean, th this was the early 2000s, so is this just doing their splash effect to try and give it this edgy look on the interior, or is this interior just kind of uh, peeling away and falling apart? Well, I think they had a wild animal that had been sucking down a lot of energy drinks that was locked in here, or, more importantly, people who are relatively tall, and I can talk from experience here, um, they rub their knees on these horribly painted components and it comes off after a while. This car has been well used, and if you look at the seats very carefully, you can see that they've actually have some uh, rem remnants of God knows what on them. So everything is like really well used on this car, and it may be a reason why this thing is not gonna be a super hot seller in my book. Well, Nathan, Let's get this out on the road. Let's take it for a little test drive and see if this lives up to the SS name. All right, Nathan, so I get the opportunity to drive this vehicle, uh, but I noticed before you sat in that passenger seat, you went and grabbed something to put under your rear there. Yeah. What did you do? Um, a lot of these vehicles come with, and this is a top tip for you people coming to an auction, um, they have uh, protection for the floor where they'll put paper on there like you would at any dealership, right? So I took a little bit of that and uh, essentially put it on the seat because I do not know what those stains are and I don't want to know. <laughs> yeah, and I'm avoiding putting my arm on that center armrest because it is quite sticky with uh, some sort of goo covering it. But I digress a little bit. As far as the driving characteristics of this Cobalt, I have to say I've driven a bunch of Cobalts in my time mm -hmm. and this kind of feels like a Cobalt with a leather wrap steering wheel and that's about it. It doesn't really feel that different from the entry-level cheap econo box that well, they first came out with. When you make your turn here and just kind of wiggle the steering wheel around, I, I think this had the stiffer suspension set up, which gives it the lower profile and everything else. So it looks and sort of feels a little bit like an SS in that respect. Well, and we have brakes and we're on the test track now. I know you were a little nervous with that 300. This being a front-wheel drive Sporty car. Um, I am not as nervous, so I'm just gonna floor the piss out of it and see how quick we can get going. A little bit of tire spin there, and it just told me low traction, which is thank you, Captain Obvious. But I got it up to 35 miles an hour on the little test track here. It which sounded is... okay too. The, the exhaust note, you know, from the beefed up uh, exhaust sounds okay. I think it drove fine, and I do think it has a sportier suspension than a regular Cobalt. Yeah, it's definitely a little uh, tighter 
tighter. I will say this one, I can hear a little bit of a clunk coming from the front end. And the so, end back too. Yeah, so <laughs> it's it's got uh, some bushings that are needing to be attended to on it. But overall, actually, other than the stickiness that we like to make fun of and mm -hmm. the peeling on the interior, it's, it's not bad. Most of these cobalts that I see are rough and gross and nasty because they just have the worst owners and i'm sorry to those cobalt owners out there i'm sure there are a few gems but most of you mistreat these horribly yeah yeah i will say that um, this car has potential to be saved because the engine and transmission and brakes all seem pretty tight so everything's working uh and it has power steering unlike the other one which is nice um but it's also really rough, and I will be getting a tetanus shot when I'm done with this, including possibly <laughs> some other things. Well, let's park it up and see whether we will buy it or bust it. All right, so Nathami, what uh, what do you think? Would you buy or bust the middle ground Cobalt SS? From the outside, the paint is in decent shape. It actually has relatively clear headlights, and the wheels are almost harshly not but they actually are pretty scratched up. So there's a lot to say about this car that's positive. Engine transmission seems pretty good. Steering's okay. Brakes work. But I'm not going to buy it. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I'm going to bust this car as well, simply because you take so much of the fun out of a front-wheel drive sporty car by putting an automatic in it. And I know this is kind of a measure to appeal to more buyers in the time that they wanted to offer it in an automatic because previously it was manual only, but I think it lost a lot of the fun that made the SS such a special vehicle. Um, but as far as values on it go, I think that this, even though it runs and drives pretty good, I think at best is like a $3,000 vehicle. What do you think? I think that if somebody doesn't pay attention and thinks they're buying the supercharged one, they're going to pay a lot of money. But if they figure out that this is not supercharged, I think they're going to be paying about 2,500 bucks. All right, let's find out who's right. All right, so next up was the Cobalt SS. And Nathan, your guess was $2,500. Mm -hmm. Mine was $3,000. Again, we were really close on our numbers there. Uh, the Cobalt SS opened at an asking price of $2,000. It eventually got its first bid at $1,000 ah. and eventually selling for $2,800. So this was a really, really close one, but I did win, but only by about a hundred bucks. Oh, what a shame. I was so close and that car's not worth it. Yeah. <laughs> and for our final car, we are bringing out quite possibly one of the most appreciated cars on this entire lot, none other than the second generation BMW 6 Series. That's right, this baby is a 2005 and it has a 4.4 liter V8. And for some reason, these vehicles just never resonated with people. And while their brothers and sisters, 5 Series and 7 Series, sell quite well, these do not. And as such, this could be a diamond in the rough. Yeah, I mean, these were what, about $70,000 brand new and you're gonna get it for a lot less than that, which we'll get to later. But this engine is no slouch. It had about, what, 325-ish horsepower. Mm -hmm. um, now, this was replaced by the 650, which had a, quite a bit more power, uh, you know, in the upper 300s. You could also get the V10 version, which was the M6 with 500 horsepower. But this is kind of the entry level, at least of the, of the ones we got here in the States. So it's the least desirable of what a lot of people consider one of the ugliest cars BMW's made. Which, yeah, but I'll leave that up to you guys whether or not you think it's ugly. However, unfortunately, it hasn't lived a very nice life. And um, some of that evidence can be seen on the hood, but more importantly, on the door. Yeah, something happened to create those marks. And see the marks on the door? Yeah, yeah it's these, worth uh, noting. These, may, these kind of look like they were holes that have been filled in, or maybe they weren't filled in and they just got grazed all the way down to the metal underneath. It certainly looks like that this car got nailed at an angle with uh, a gun. And I'll let you guys use your imagination in terms of the caliber uh, or how many millimeters. And look, it goes all the way back over there as well. So it does definitely look like something happened to it, but it doesn't affect this vehicle's engine, which seems to run quite good. Well, but I will say though, the most iconic thing about this is the bangle butt, right? This buttress that 
it's kind of weird. It's like flat yet sculpted at the same time. Uh, and everybody hated this Bengal butt when it first came out, but I think as time has gone on, it's kind of growing on me a little bit. I have to say, it's not such a bad look. Tommy says you're wrong, and I might agree with him. Uh, and when ba when Chris Bengal designed the, I believe he also did the 7 Series, which is the first car that we noticed, which had the flames, I think he called them some sort of flames look on the back. Yeah. A lot of people did the little throw up thing in their mouth, like a little, <laughs> little bit of bile came up. So this I think is less in your face and I don't think it's horrible, but I've seen some guys do some interesting things aftermarket with these. Regardless, it still is a BMW and it does have a V8. Well, and of course it's gonna have a luxurious inter interior. So let's check that out. All right, so hop on in there, my friend. Yeah, hey, look at that. Is that, is that a manual? No. Oh, it certainly looks like it, but it's What a tease. Not. What a tease. This does legitimately look like a stick shift, but it says SMG on it, which is a little unfortunate. These SMGs, I think, were probably one of the biggest downfalls of these cars because, I mean, it's just, it's kind of archaic the way that it shifts, and it's, it's not the best thing in the world. They're not the most reliable transmissions. So if you can find them with a manual transmission, that's going to be the creme de la creme. But... I think the SMG will make this nice and cheap, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, hey, by the way, you notice how nice the seats are? They are pretty damn comfortable. They are pretty comfortable. And I will say you do have surprising amount of storage here in the center console. This does have the early iDrive system, which is why this big giant dial is going on right here. And why you do have a screen up here above the climate controls. Um, but yeah, it's just, it actually is a surprisingly basic interior. I mean, it feels nicely appointed. The leather feels like it's a decent quality. But beyond that, you know, it doesn't feel as luxurious as I thought it would be, but I think the important part is how it's going to drive. So let's take it out for a spin. Uh, first couple of issues right off the bat. A lot of people don't know how these transmissions work, and I'm one of them. I basically just put it in the drive, but you can run it like a manual, and it does have paddle shifters as well which are disappointing in their field, to be honest with you. Yeah, it just kind of looks like a cheap plastic, honestly. Yeah, it doesn't um, it doesn't scream BMW or like it's a luxury car to me, which this is supposed to be like a grand touring luxury sports car, right? It, Andy, a, a GT car is exactly how you would describe this. This is a perfect example of a doctor's car or a lawyer's car, whatever. You know, you do have a backseat if you need it, but really it's for golf clubs. The whole purpose of this vehicle is to go down the Autobahn at a high rate of speed and just cruise and enjoy the ride. The rides are really well sorted in these. That I remember from the past. But at the same time, the amount of tech that this thing has, considering what it is, is kind of disappointing. Yeah, and I have to say, I mean, we, we are talking about sleepers generally here, which I would say the first two cars kind of qualify as a sleeper, right? Mm -hmm. This one, people are going to expect at least some level of performance out of it. Um, but I, yeah. I just don't know that it's going to live up to that sleeper name because it has that expectation of some sort of level of performance. But... I, I will say, though, if I do see one of these going down the road, uh, I don't expect them to be fast in any way. Like, most people that are driving these around are of the geriatric age, you know, like... Roman. Roman. Yeah. And um, are kind of going about five miles an hour under the speed limit. In many cases, you would be right. And I won't debate with you, and even Tommy would agree. However, these cars are actually surprisingly fleet of foot. That 325 horsepower comes on strong. It's a very torquey powertrain. And if you get the transmission that doesn't have the glitches in it, which we're about to find out about, then you actually have a vehicle that shifts boom, 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 fast. Well, we're on the test track here. I want to see, can you achieve 40 miles an hour before slamming on the brakes in this? Ooh, a little bit of tire spin there, getting up to speed. Did, what, did, what happened? So second gear didn't want to shift. Oh. <laughs> but I got up to 40. You got up to yeah. 40 in first gear? Yeah. Wow. No, no, it went to second gear. We don't want to go to third. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. 
So I don't. So it's you know it, it's it's maybe a little bit rough around the edges. Maybe uh, the transmission isn't acting the way that it should, or is that just how SMGs are from the factory? Dude, the car got shot at. You're yeah. saying <laughs> you know the term bulletproof? No. Yeah. It, it, although it, it managed, none of those really are giant holes, but they're definitely bullet uh, wounds. So I, yeah, <laughs> I, I keep coming back to that. If a car has been involved in a shooting already i'm thinking mm, i might want to lower that price all right well let's park it up and see whether we will buy it or bust it all right hey brendan tommy and i want to know are you going to buy it or bust it well here's the thing i actually really like these cars quite a bit even just the base 645 is a really cool car but that transmission makes it a bust for me i don't think i would ever want to own anything with an smg transmission what about you? I agree with you 100%, not only that, but it has bullet holes in it. So yeah, I wouldn't, I, I'm trying to think of it as someone who would sell a car. And so I think that that might make it unsellable. Yeah, well, as far as pricing goes, I think that, I mean, this is still a somewhat desirable vehicle for some people out there uh, that are looking for something like this. So I think across the auction block, this is gonna fetch maybe $4,000. What mm. do you think? I think that someone's going to make a mistake and try to buy it for six thousand. Six thousand dollars? Yeah, I think someone's going to just not know that the transmission is a little hanky, and they're going to try to buy it, and they're going to be unhappy. So I say six thousand. All right. Well, let's see who's right. All right, Nathan. So last up was that BMW Six Series, and your guess was six thousand dollars. My guess was four thousand dollars. And well, something happened at the auction that neither of us could have predicted in the fact that it died going across the auction block. And so <laughs> it took a team of auctioneers to get behind it and actually push this thing across the auction block. Uh, and as such, it went for a lot less than we thought. Uh, they started off by asking a measly $2,000 for it. And someone finally said, I'll give you fifteen hundred, and they took it, and that's what it sold for at fifteen hundred dollars. I blame my loss on that one on the bullet holes that that car had because it was shot at quite a bit. Well, and being pushed across the auction which block doesn't help. Which is the direct either. result of those yeah. bullet holes being yeah. <laughs> This has been fun. I'm sorry to have wiped the floor with you once yes, again, yes, yes. but it's a valiant effort. You were super close on that Cobalt SS, so you deserve some credit there. It's not like you were that far off from me. Um, but thank you guys so much for watching, and take care.